So thank you, Diane, for that nice introduction. So yeah, my name is Moni, which is short for Monica. In um, Spanish, all Monicas are called Monis, like in English, Patricias are called Patty. And so Moni is short for Monica. But only people who are mad at me call me Monica. And so don't call me Monica. I come from Ecuador, which is a, a country where, can you guys guess where Ecuador is? is it? The South America is right on the equator. So people think that because I was born near the equator, it must have been hot. But we have the Andes Mountains there. And Quito, the city where I was born, is 9,300 feet above sea level, which means there's less oxygen, right? Uh, my, uh, we took my kids a few years ago so they could uh, tour Ecuador and know about the roots. And uh, we had such a hard time adapting to the altitude because I've been over 20 years in the United States, right? And so I had a, we had to go to a place that was on the second floor. And there were um, two flights of stairs, seven steps a landing and then set another seven steps. And we were so not used to the lack of oxygen that we could go up the first seven steps, sit down, take a break, and then go up the next seven steps. You know, that's how different that is. So because I was in Ecuador, things don't work the same. I was um, born about half an hour from the equator. And uh, if you look up, like on YouTube, um, the equator in Ecuador, they have all these experiments where they have filmed where the water goes one way, the drains you know, go one way on the one side of the line and the other way on the other side of the line and other experiments they do with um, magnetism. And so things don't work the same in Ecuador as they would work in the northern hemisphere or the southern hemisphere. And also when you are so high up, there's other things that don't work, right? For example, cooking doesn't work the same. Here, if you're making rice, it's going to take you maybe seven minutes if it's white rice. We're making pasta, right? In when you're that high up, it takes you a lot longer because there's less oxygen, the pressure is different. And so one of the things that happened to me from having been born so high up and um, in, on the equator is that the information that I read from books did not match my reality. And so we would get our science books would come from Spain, from Mexico, or from the United States. And uh, the experiments they were doing, they did not work in Ecuador. And if you got a cookbook, most of our cookbooks were printed in Mexico, the United States, or Spain again. And so the recipes did not work because we were so high up, right? And so what this produced in me was a distrust of information. And uh, I realized that you know, being in Ecuador, I had to test an experiment. And so I brought this attitude with me to the United States. You know, I trained as an architect in Ecuador, which is six and a half years over there. And uh, when I came to the United States, I became interested in feng shui. And I did not take feng shui at face value. You know, I don't uh, take a book and read a book and immediately believe the book. I have to test everything. I have to make sure it works. So this was very interesting because in feng shui, there's a lot of confusion. And uh, so raise your hand if you ever read a book on feng shui. Keep your hand up if you read more than one book on feng shui. And so you put your hands down now. So what happens is, is people read their first book on feng shui, and they're like, yeah, I got this. And then they read their second book on feng shui, and they're like, I don't have this at all. Because the information may be different, and sometimes even contradictory. And so we're going to talk a little bit about why that happens. But what I did about 20 years ago with feng shui is that I tested everything. And uh, because feng shui comes from China, I also found a way in which I could figure out what feng shui information was correct and which wasn't. So my son here is going to help me. Um, you know, I didn't realize I had walked away from the camera. My son is going to help me with the slideshow. So feng shui is the ancient art of placement or space arrangement which aims at creating healthy, balanced, and harmonious environments where people can be happy, healthy, prosperous, and free. Next one. And so, way back when, right, thousands of years ago in China, when there was no weather channel, where there was no information on the, the geology of a place, 
people needed to figure out um, how to differentiate a place where it would be okay to settle from a place where it would not be okay to settle. So they would look at certain things. For example, the type of vegetation, the age of the trees was very important. So for example, if you went to a place and you're thinking, this might be a, a nice place to settle, and the vegetation is really healthy, but there's no trees older than 30 years. What would that mean? Can anybody guess? Yeah? No? Something happened. There was some kind of natural disaster that happened 30 years ago, right? And so if you go to a place and it looks like a really nice place to settle, but you find a lot of rocks that have been cut almost with geometrical precision, what could that indicate? This place probably has earthquakes. And so the first Feng Shui consultants, they had to learn to read the signs of the land in order to figure out if a place would be okay to settle or not before there was a flood that took away grandmother's remains. You know, in China, ancestor um, worship is a very important thing. And so finding safe places where you could um, have your cemeteries was super, super important. And so um, let me tell you a, a little bit about what something that happened uh, to my husband and I. When um, we were living in Mississippi, he convinced me to go see a chiropractor because I suffer from migraines. And then I liked it so much, I decided he should become a chiropractor. <laughs> and uh, so we moved to Davenport, Iowa, where the first school of chiropractic is located. And uh, the, the years while he was doing his pre-med, before we moved to Iowa, every single year in the news, uh, there were stories about how Davenport had gotten flooded again, because Davenport is by the shores of the Mississippi River. Then my husband and I moved to Davenport, thinking, thinking we're going to have to work and pile up those sandbags, right? We were there for five years, and Davenport did not flood. Then after those five years, we moved to Knoxville, Tennessee, and that year, Davenport flooded again. So based on our experience, there were no floods ever in Davenport, right? And so that's one of the things that Fauché Consultant had to be trained to perceive that. And so the, what they concluded that was that the best type of settlement that you could find was this. And so you needed to be near water because you need water to live, right? You cannot um, thrive if you don't have fresh water nearby. But you couldn't be too close to the water or at the water level because then you could get flooded. So you need to be a little bit higher than the water. Your plot of land needed to be flat because flat land is a lot easier to plow. But you wanted to have a protection at the back. China geologically is very similar to the United States and Feng Shui started in China. And so where do the worst winds come from? From the northwest, right? And, um, but mostly um, from the north because of the North Pole, right? Now in, uh, in Knoxville particularly, it's from the west. And so in China, the most feared winds were coming from the north. And so you had to have a hill at the north and you had to face the house towards the south. Now, if you were in Australia, this would be inverted, right? Then you would fear the winds from the south, from the South Pole, and you would have to face the north so that you could have a sunny entrance. Now, on the sides, you wanted to have hills to protect you from the winds and also from excessive sunshine in the early morning so that you can, in the summer, have more hours to work in the farm. And so there were all these uh, rules that the Feng Shui consultants determined were, um, would give you some warranty that a place would be good to settle. And so, for thousands of years, Feng Shui developed in this way. Feng Shui didn't have a name. It was just known as the art of the master. It was known by the master of the province where they practiced this. But um, around 2,400 years ago, there was a urban explosion in China. So. 
people started building large cities and moving into cities. So what happens in cities, especially the cities near the coast, you can't find that hill behind you, the ridges on the sides. You can't have in the city, not everybody can have a waterfront, right? And so von Shui consultants, they will face this challenge. You know, what are we going to do now that we can't help people find an ideal site where they can live in harmony with nature? So they were two reactions. And at this point, feng shui split into two branches. So one of the branches said, we're going to introduce individual feng shui by using astrology and numerology. That was the one, the one branch went that way. And the other branch said, let's treat city buildings as if they were natural features and use common and uncommon sense to mimic healthy natural spaces. And so this is uh, what they figured out. You know, on the outside, you will still want to face the sunshine. Wherever, um, it could be the south, it could be the east or the west. In the United States, you want to avoid a north entrance. The more north you go, the more you want to avoid the north entrance because there's going to be a cold, humid, moldy entrance. And uh, you still want to have a building behind you that's larger than yours buildings on the sides that are a little larger than yours to represent the ridges, and a, a street in front of the house, and a building that is lower than your own building across the street. Oh, okay. go back. That's on the outside. But on the inside, this Feng Shui consultant said, people are living in boxes now. And people were not designed to live in boxes. People were designed to live in harmony with nature, right? And so what they decided was that you needed to create the impression of nature inside of the home. That is why in feng shui, it's so common to have uh, fish tanks or um, water fountains, uh, plants, and so that you can create that impression of thriving nature inside of the home because we are hardwired to recognize nature as um, thriving nature as security, as a science of easy survival. And so this uh, um, feng shui split into these two branches. And most feng shui that you find out there, if you want to go look online and research feng shui, most feng shui you're going to find has to do with astrology and numerology, because that branch became more popular. But the kind of feng shui I practice is based on what is called form school, which, is, uh, which aims at creating or recreating in your home, outside and inside of your home, the characteristics that would make your home um, reproduce those uh, characteristics of thriving nature. You all have any, do you all have any questions so far? No? Okay. So, um, my assistants, please distribute the brochures. And then uh, move the next slide, move to the next slide. So you're going to get some brochures. And um, I was telling you before, when I was facing all this confusion about feng shui, I kind of got lucky because I was able to work with someone who practices Chinese medicine and study some Chinese medicine because the same basic principles that ruled things like acupuncture or tai chi are the same principles that rule feng shui. So my rule of thumb became is um, to compare all the information that I was receiving in feng shui, to compare that with acupuncture and see if that would translate to acupuncture and it would make sense. And so there's uh, certain things that people need in order to be healthy, happy, prosperous, and free. And so the first one is energetic wholeness. And uh, we are, I placed something inside your brochure that is going to help us understand this. But first of all, you want to have energetic wholeness. And what this boils down to is to believing that right here, right now, you have everything you need to be happy. Then you need to have energetic balance. And what that means is that you're going to balance work and fun, that you're going to balance your private and public life, 
and basically that you are not going to live your life as if you were going through a roller coaster. The next thing is uh, freeing chi to heal, that would be the Chinese term, but what this translates into is just vitality. You need to have vitality, you cannot go through life fatigued, right? Then you need to be in tune with nature because we are high wired, we're programmed to thrive when we are in connection with nature. We need to have a harmony of the elements. This is about arguments, you know, we can't be happy if we are having arguments every day. Then we need to understand the power of vibrations and the way that, um, the way that is represented in feng shui, it has to do with language, the way we use language in the home. Then we need to be able to heal the past. No matter what happened to us in the past or even what we did, we need to be able to say from now on, I am in charge of my destiny. I am a co-designer of my life. And um, we need to be able to set wholesome goals. Because if you are living with no goals, you're not going to get anywhere. right? And uh, finally, you need to start being comfortable, comfortable living from a position of power. And so you have, next slide please, you have some brochures that you have just received, right? And then I'm going to take one for me right here. And if you open up your brochures in the middle, you are going to see a panel that says from hidden enemy to BFF. Who here knows what BFF means? Best friend forever, right? Millennials use this term, BFF. And so the thing is, if you do not know about feng shui and if you're not using feng shui, your home may be acting as your hidden enemy right now instead of being your BFF, your best friend. And so these are the things that your home may be promoting. And so does everybody have something to ride with? Nope. Okay, so we have some pens here. Maybe we can pass them around. And so, your home may be promoting self-doubt. Your home may also be encouraging you to live like a roller coaster instead of living a balanced life. Your home may be making you tired. Your home can also be encouraging hesitation, disharmony, self-sabotage, messes. Messes is what slows you down, right? Lack of focus and disempowerment. And so the reason I want you to have something to write with is that you'll see there's a line underneath each word. And so that line is for you to fill in where it happens in the home. Aren't you curious to learn, you know, like where is self-doubt happening in your home? Next, please. And so, because you doubt yourself, you make excuses instead of plans. And these excuses can be about anything. Now, an excuse is not a reason, right? If an excuse was a reason, we would say, if there's a reason why I don't do the things I want to do. An excuse is what we use to pretend it's a reason, to pretend we have good reasons to not do the things that we want to do or the things that we need to do. And so where does it show in the home? It shows in the shape of your floor plan and where your bathrooms are located. And so in feng shui, the feng shui masters over centuries have determined that if your home is not square or rectangular, like if your home has an irregular shape, you are not going to feel a sense of wholeness or completeness. And then you start making excuses and you're saying, well, I would do that if I had a university degree. I would be happy if I found a partner. I, um, if I had more money, I would eat healthy. And so this tendency to make excuses instead of making plans to improve your life is shown in the shape of the floor plan or in problematic location of the bathrooms. So does anybody here live in a home that is not complete, not a full rectangle or not a full square? No one? Does everybody here live in homes that are completely square or rectangular? Yeah? That is unusual. 
And so, if your uh, floor plan was an L shape or a C shape, for example, yes? Yeah. So your home used to be a rectangle. Somebody built an addition, so it's no longer um, yeah, a rectangle. So in feng shui, we look at where is that located. If there's areas that are missing, where is that located, and how does that influence your life today? But some people say, okay, my house is a perfect square, it's a perfect rectangle. They think there's nothing to do. But sometimes, if your bathroom is located exactly in a corner, um, show me the next slide. I'm not sure that. Uh, yeah. And so in feng shui, we map the floor plan. So we get. If your home is a square, you do like a tic-tac-toe and you get nine squares. If your home is a rectangle, you do a tic-tac-toe and you get nine rectangles. Does that make sense? Aligning the wall that contains your front door with the bottom of the map. And so if your bathroom, especially the toilet, is located in a corner, you know, in either of these corners, that's a problem. So say, for example, that your bathroom was located here. Maybe you are thinking your marriage is going down the toilet, right? Or if it's here, my career is going down the toilet. We have so many expressions in the English language that have to do with things going down the toilet. It is not a good association, right? And so if you had a bathroom right here, we have to treat your home as if the floor plan was incomplete. And so let's go to the next one. So fill in, right? In your, under the first line would be incomplete floor plan or bad toilet location. The second is lack of balance. When your life is out of balance, nothing works or feels right because you're on this roller coaster, right? And the roller coaster is going to make you exhausted. And so where does this show in the home? Let's see. In hallways and staircases. So big problems in feng shui are hallways that are, remember to write it in, right? Um, hallways that are long and narrow. Does anybody have a hallway that is long and narrow in your home? Yeah? And, or do you have a staircase? Another problem in feng shui is when the staircase is uh, in just one flight with no landing. Does anybody have a staircase with no landing? Yeah, and so that in feng shui is considered a problem. That is an imbalance. And so most people recognize that hallways and staircases are problems and they try and fix them. But most people fix them the wrong way. So a lot of people, when they have a long and narrow hallway, and they're like, this is dark. I'm going to add a mirror to add some light and some vitality. And where do they put it? Where do most people place that mirror in the hallway? At the end of the hallway. And what that does, it makes your hallways twice as long, right? And then staircases, you know, staircases, um, women are like, usually women, they say, well, this, uh, this doesn't look good. You know, this looks bad. I'm going to decorate it, and I'm going to put um, photos of my family on this hallway. And when they put the photos of the family, they made it go down with every step. So that emphasizes the slant of the step and makes the imbalance even worse. So hallways and staircases, that's where it shows. Now, the next one. If you feel tired at home, it's hard to get, it's hard to get things done, right? And so this is especially true if sometimes you are at work and you think, when I get home, I'm going to do this, 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 and that. And as soon as you get home, there's no energy, it's just plop yourself in front of the TV and do nothing. Eat junk. You know, like, yeah, I'm going to go home and I'm going to cook a healthy meal. And when you get, you know, when you get home, it's going to be a snack and uh, nothing healthy about it. And so where does this show in the home? If you feel tired at home, it shows in the front entrance and what you see from there. So sometimes people feel tired, so it's the front entrance and the first thing you see under fatigue. And so sometimes if your home is not welcoming on the outside, 
not enough vitality is coming into the home. And when you first open the door, the first thing you see may be taking away the vitality of your home. So bad things to see when you first open the door. Staircases. So if you open the door and the first thing you see is a staircase going up, that's going to make you feel like your life is very, very hard. Because as soon as you get home, you have to use those leg muscles to go up, right? Everything is so hard. Now, if you see a staircase going down, it's like my life is going downhill. If the first thing you see is a split foyer, you're going to have a very hard time making decisions because you're going to be fatigued. Every time you come home, you have to decide. Now, the first thing you do when you come home is you have to make a decision. So those are problems. Other problems, if, the, if you see the back door, as soon as you come in the house, you tend to feel tired, exhausted in that house. If you see a large window, no matter how beautiful the view, if you see a large window, the first thing, you are going to get fatigued in that house. If the first thing you see is the bathroom, not good, right, For, because of so many associations with the toilet. The first thing you see is the laundry room, you're going to feel like housework is never over. If the first thing you see is the refrigerator, you're going to feel like snacking all the time. And so what we do in feng shui is we control what you see when you come in. So we have corrections that we do, and we guide. You know, we, we place certain things in certain key spots so that when you come in, you, we guide your attention to something other than the problem. So the next one, hesitation, right? Hesitation makes you miss out on opportunities. So you hesitate and miss out on opportunities. Where could this happen in the home? Windows, calendars, and clocks. I once had a client that told me he was a um, government employee, and he said, I have not had a promotion or a raise in over eight years. And when I went to his home, all the clocks had stopped. This family, when a clock stopped working, they would not replace the battery, they bought another clock. So they took down 12 clocks from their walls that were not working. So everybody in the family had to remember which was the current clock that actually showed the right time. And this family never threw away calendars. They just pinned the new calendar on top of the previous one. So they took down 12 calendars that were old. When you, if, you're not, if your home doesn't show you the right time or the right date, how can you be in tune with nature? How can you take advantage of opportunities, right? And so, and the other one is windows. And this is where Americans like to argue with me. You have to have window treatments. It doesn't matter what beautiful views you have. Because there are a lot of people, they tell me, you know, I don't like curtains because I have a beautiful garden or I have a beautiful view of the Smoky Mountains. The curtains would uh, interrupt the beauty, right? And, um, and then I ask them, so what does it look like at night? If you don't have any curtains or window treatments, and you can see it, you know, like we have here at the entrance, there's a glass door that you came in, and you can look at it when, as you are leaving, look at it. It's a black rectangle. If you don't have window treatments, you have black rectangles. So if you have eight windows in your home where you have not put curtains on them, then at night, you have eight black rectangles. Would you go to a gallery and say, hey, I want to buy eight large pieces of artwork that I will paint it black? You wouldn't, right? But that's what you end up with at night if you don't have any curtains or window treatments. And so what that does is it makes you fatigued and it makes you disconnect from nature. So when your lights are on, you are going to see your windows that have no treatment, they're going to look black to you, right? But when you turn off the lights, you are going to be disturbed by the outside lights, by any lights your neighbors have on, by any street lights, by the headlights of any cars driving by. Do you agree? And so what that's going to do is it's going to disrupt your circadian rhythm, it's going to affect your sleep, 
and you are not going to be able to function the way you should function. So under hesitation, right? Windows, clocks and calendars. The next one, disharmony. You don't get along with each other, you argue a lot. So where does this show in the home? Oh, I have the wrong heading there, I apologize. It shows in colors, shapes, and materials. So if your colors are clashing, it makes it more likely that you're gonna argue. And that's easy to fix, right? Anybody can tell if colors are clashing. But also if your shapes and materials are clashing, and that you, that's something you would only knew if you had studied feng shui, that can also increase arguments. And so there are other features, for example, if you have the stove and the sink opposite each other, that's going to increase arguments. If your sink and your stove are right next to each other, that will increase arguments. If your sink and your stove are on an L shape, where you have a little bit of a corner um, counter, and then you have the stove and then the sink, that's going to increase arguments. And I've seen it happen many times, and I've seen it corrected once we apply the right feng shui cures. And so, and in the feng shui, we use something called the five elements to define what colors are clashing, what materials are clashing, what, what kinds of shapes are clashing. So this is something um, that you would only know if you had studied it, right? The part on colors, if you have a good eye for color, you're like, yeah, you know, that doesn't look right. But there's other things you have to have a little bit more knowledge to uh, realize what is the problem. Next slide, please. So under this harmony, did you write colors, shapes, materials? The next one is self-sabotage. Now, everybody self-sabotages. I'm not going to raise your hand and ask who self-sabotages here because everybody self-sabotages. It's just part of being human. You know, If you didn't ask self-sabotage, you would not be human. Um, but some people may self-sabotage in little things and other people may self-sabotage in big things. And so um, I had a client once that had been divorced for 10 years. And after she divorced, she had never thought about love, never gone on a date, never had a, God bless you, never had a love interest, right? And um, so she hired me and I found, I went in her bedroom and I saw her bedroom was not set up for love. And so we did some changes in her bedroom. And a week later, she told me, I have been asked on my first date in 10 years. So she went on her date and in the beginning, she liked the guy, then she thought that this guy wanted to go too fast, so she said, no, I'm not interested. And then nothing, right? And then um, I went to her home, you know, six months later, she said, you know, something's not working. And when I went in her bedroom, she had put up nine images of goddesses. And, uh, and I'm like, why did you do here? And she said, because, you know, if you look at the Bawa map, um, her bedroom was in a life area that has to do with spirituality. And she said, you know, I, um, I believe in these things and uh, I thought placing images of goddesses would make me um, more powerful as a woman. But an image of goddess to your deep mind, to your unconscious mind, in that, the same way what your religion is, an image of a goddess is a single woman. And so she had put nine images of single women in her bedroom. And so while well, consciously she was saying, I want a date, I want to find a partner. Unconsciously, she was saying, I want to stay single. And so, in Feng Shui, where does this show? What do I look for? Art, mirrors, and photos. And so, you may be self-sabotaging by the artwork that you have chosen. You may self-sabotaging by the photos you place in your home. You know, one thing that I do with clients is I help them set uh, healthy boundaries with in-laws. Everybody here ever have trouble with in-laws? It's very common, right? And so, where you place photos of your in-laws, what size the pictures are, what kinds of frames you put them on, what part of the home you place them, can make or break your relationship with your in-laws, literally. And another thing we look at is mirrors. And so, in Feng Shui, we do not use any mirrors that would distort the image in any way, 
any mirrors that would fragment the image in any way, like those beautiful mosaic mirrors, or any mirrors that would deform the image in any way, such as a concave or a convex mirror. Why? Because when you look in one of those mirrors, you are not getting truth. You are getting something that is not like what reality is. And this even includes those beautiful bevels on expensive mirrors. You know what I mean? The bevel is that slanted edge that you have on the sides of mirrors. Most expensive mirrors have them. They are very, very, very bad feng shui. And so did you write under self-sabotage, art, photos, and mirrors. Um, another thing is, I can usually go into a home and if you have more than one child, I can tell who's your favorite within five minutes. By the photos. And if I can tell, they can tell too. A lady once told me, you know, I told her, you know, she had three kids, and I told, you, I told her, the boy's your favorite, isn't he? And he says, how do you know? Not even my husband knows that. And it was because of where she put the photo, right? And so it's very important to learn. For him, family harmony, it's very important to learn how to place mirrors. Um, photos, I mean. Uh, so these three things, art, mirrors, and photos, they are the language of the home. Everything, every image that you put on your walls is telling you something. So you want those messages to be good. The next one is message, right? And um, you block your own way and slow down your progress would be the thing that you do with messes, but not any kind of mess, a particular kind of mess, which is clutter. Clutter slows you down. Clutter holds you back. By the way, if you go on your computer and you search for leaving East Tennessee clutter, you will find some segments that uh, the show did with me and decluttering and organizing the home. So leaving East Tennessee clutter, if you search for that, you will find the segments. So the next one. You lack clear goals, your efforts don't yield results. And that is lack of focus. And so where does that show in the home? In corners and midpoints. Remember I had told you earlier that you had to be very careful to not have toilets? See the red dots? That's where you shouldn't have a toilet. And um, if you do, we fix it and we correct it. And so this um, tic-tac-toe that we give um, making a home has a meaning. And uh, when you walk out of this room, you're going to see a table that my children have set up with my latest book. And I have some little um, maps, Bagua maps of the home there that you can take you know, for free so that you'll know how to map your house. But you know, just to go really fast here, this one is a career, marriage, health and family, wealth and prosperity, good luck, travel, creativity, wisdom, and uh, reputation. And so don't worry about taking notes because you can take the little Bagua maps on your way out. And so there are key things because each of these represents something, but it's unconscious, right? Until until you learn about feng shui and you learn that these sectors of your home represent a life area, there's no way for you to know. But once you know, you can place key ornaments and enhancements in the different places to set clear goals for yourself. You know, if you don't have um, goals, it's like being in a sailboat and just uh, letting the, the water currents and the winds take you wherever they want, right? So you don't want to live like that. You want to have clear goals and focus. Next one. So you're living a disempowered life. And part of this, and so in your brochure, right? Under seven, it was clutter. And under eight, it's uh, corners and midpoints. That's what it shows. And then a disempowered life is a little bit of um, an accumulation of all of the above, right? But where it shows the most is in this. Furniture placement. And I don't, you know, I apologize. I should have changed that image to an image of um, furniture. I'm sorry about that. So go one more. 
Okay, and so in Feng Shui we have certain rules in how to place furniture, so like how to arrange your master bedroom so you sleep better and have a better relationship with your spouse. Um, we have rules on how to arrange your home office so you're more productive, um, how to arrange your dining room so you eat at your table instead of in front of the TV, right? Or in front of the computer, how to arrange your um, your living room so you are more sociable, so that you get out more and don't spend your life in front of the TV. And so these rules, um, they work. You know, you may feel like you could never do any work in an office, and once you move the furniture around, then all of a sudden you can. And so, do you have any questions so far, or comments? Okay, and so the nine steps to Feng Shui system that I developed is based on these nine things that the home as the enemy is doing to you. And the nine steps to Feng Shui was designed to turn your enemy home into your BFF. And so we, uh, we do certain things. You know, first, we complete the floor plan, including dealing with problem location of the toilets. We balance your staircases and your hallways. We make sure there's a good circulation of qi. Qi, it means the life force. We help you connect with nature by working on your windows, calendars and clocks. We create a harmony of color, shapes, and materials. We control the language of your home by seeing what you're putting on your walls. We help you heal through decluttering so that you don't slow yourself and you don't hold yourself back. We help you set healthy goals on each of the nine life areas and we, leave, we help you live from a place of power. So what's, that's what the nice steps to Feng Shui does for you. So next. Um, so are you lucky? In Feng Shui, the word luck is not the same as chance. So it's not like some people are lucky, some people are not, and nobody knows why. And so luck in feng shui is a result of your internal condition. If you are, if you are well, things go well. Does that make sense? And so one way for you to be well is for your home to have good feng shui. So this is something you know, most healing works from the inside out, but feng shui works from the outside in. Next one. And so your home as your BFF would tell you certain things. Next what each room in the home should tell you. Uh, Fanny, can you hand me the book that's in my bag? And so, your home should be telling you certain things, and we're going to go room by room. Room by room is also the name of my new book. And uh, so your foyer should be giving you this main message. You are doing great. You are successful. So your foyer should be magnificent. If anything, the furniture in your foyer should be the most luxurious in the home. So when you open up that door, it's like, wow, I'm doing great. I have great taste. The living room should be telling you, you have a place in the world. Because that has to do with fame and reputation and rank. Where are you in your social community? The dining room should be telling you, you are not alone. Your kitchen should be telling you, you matter. You are important. Your hallway should be telling you, you are connected, because the hallway connects the different rooms in your home. The children's bedrooms or your hobby room or your arts and crafts room in the home should tell you, you can get things done. You are creative. Your home office, specifically, you can get things done, right? And uh, the master bedroom, you know how to love. And here's the thing. Most, uh, um, in feng shui, we don't work to keep love alive because love grows naturally, except when there's abuse or deceit. The more you live with a person, the more you love them. You know, if it's true for your dog and your cat, why wouldn't it be true for a spouse? The more you have them, the more you love them. Except if there's abuse or deceit, then there's no love. Um, but a lot of people don't know how to love. And in Feng Shui, the most important uh, qualities uh, for love are being generous, 
and being able to yield. And so when we work on the master bedroom, we work on equality of importance. So I'm not saying men and women are equal. A lot of people may say that. Um, that's not the belief in feng shui. In feng shui, we don't believe men and women are equal, but they are equally important. Does that make sense? And so, you know, um, it really no two people are equal, right? And so, but they are equally important. And so what I see with my clients is usually men have no trouble thinking they're important. But women have trouble thinking that they're as important as the spouse. And so a lot of women immediately understand, yeah, you know, my needs should be as important as the needs of my spouse. But they have a lot of trouble believing that their desires are as important as the desires of their husband. And so that's what we work on, the master bedroom. And so as I was telling you, you know, this, uh, I have written nine books of feng shui. My first eight books were manuals, so they're full of photographs, illustrations, how to do this, how to do that, how to correct this, how to correct that. And this book has no pictures except for one picture at the beginning of every chapter. Now, people are learning more from this book than from my manuals. And they are changing their homes, and they are going to my Facebook page, and they are posting the pictures of how they are improving their homes. From a book with no pictures. Can you believe that? So this was very surprising to me. This, is a, um, this book tells the story of three homes and four generations. So the three homes are my grandmother's homes, home, my parents' home, and our home that we live in right now, and the four generations are my grandmother, my parents, my husband and I, and my children. And so this book became a bestseller within 12 hours of being released in Amazon in three categories. Number one, the selling book. And people are loving it. And so we have some copies of this book at the back. This book sells for $15 plus tax on Amazon if you want to get it there and uh, it's prime available and we're going to be selling it today for 12 bucks including the tax um, so my children and husband are going to be at the table <laughs> in the entrance if you want to take a look at the book or um, buy it and so the most surprising thing to me is how people are remembering so much from the stories and they are understanding about the importance of having a nice bedroom, the importance of having a nice dining room, the importance of having a pretty kitchen, because of how it influences your life. And so I want your home to become your BFF. Do we have more slides there? That's it? OK. Um, your home should be supporting you instead of working against you. So that's the idea behind feng shui. Now, if you look at your brochure on the front page, At the bottom, you will see there's my website and blog. I have hundreds of articles on feng shui there, 9stepstofengshui.com. You see that? So you can go check my website. When you go to my website, there's going to be a window that pops up. Before you close that window automatically, I want you to consider that if you enter your email and name, you get entered into a free introductory course to feng shui. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to take a life areas test, and then you're going to learn how to interpret that test so that you can see how your life is rolling, literally. And uh, then you see at the bottom, facebook.com forward slash feng shui for us. That's my Facebook page. If you go to my Facebook page, there's going to be a button there, like my page if you like it, but there's going to be a, but a button there that says visit group. So you can click on that click a visit group, and you can ask to join my Facebook group. I post articles there all the time and tips. Right now we're doing um, kind of a decluttering challenge. I'm giving every few days, I'm giving people something to do. And I'm using the hashtag, hashtag declutter, the number two, free your soul. So if you find that hashtag, if you're, who here is conversing with Facebook? So if you go to Facebook, you know about hashtags. The first time you're scrolling down the page and you find the hashtag declutter to free your soul, you can click on that and it will show you all the posts that I have put on that page about decluttering. And so let's make a connection, right? Let's make a connection. Go to my website 
or go to my Facebook page, visit my group, ask to join my group, and let's stay in touch. Now, um, I know a lot of people, you know, they do their vision boards, and on their vision board, they put a photo of their dream home. What I want to help you do is every day take steps so that your current home becomes a dream home. And then you can decide if you want to continue living in that home or if you want to move on to a new dream home for you. But, uh, you know, there's so many people that have told me, I fixed my home to sell it and that it was so hard to sell. And I thought to myself, if I had done this a few years ago, I would have enjoyed it instead of just fixing it for somebody else to enjoy. And so that's what I have to share with you today. Thank you so much for coming. We can open up for questions if you want to do Q&A. Do we have a little time for Q&A? Sure. Okay, so...